Welcome back to the Authentic Christian Podcast. I'm Aaron. This is Tucker. This is Scott. And today we're going to talk about what is biblical love. All right. So thank you for being back with us on this episode. We're going to talk about the word love, but we're really going to talk about it from uh, the Bible's perspective. You know, when we look at culture, uh, different cultures at different times define love uh, in different ways. Sometimes cultures will say it's unloving to expose something that's wrong. They'll say, well, look, you should just basically be tolerant and accept everything. And so what we're looking to do today, as we always try to do on this show, is to look at what the Bible defines the word love as. Because if we're going to be Christians, 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Um, So we're trying to go to the Bible and say, well, this is what the Bible talks about love. So um, Scott, let's start with you today. What, if I was to ask you, what is a, uh, the Bible's definition of love? Where would you start? What's a, I guess, a passage or an idea or something? Well, <clears throat> the Bible defines love in several ways. It's, it's uh, laying down your life for your fellow man, right? Mm-hmm. It's uh, Christ's sacrifice for the world. Uh, it is First Corinthians 13. That's mm-hmm. probably the longest passage that deals with it, and it gives uh, many of those virtues or attributes of what love is, uh, especially in, uh, in terms of how we need to treat other people, Yeah, I suppose. That would be the way most people think of love. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's that's probably the go-to, to be honest. Okay. First Corinthians thirteen. Okay, maybe we'll cover that text here in a second. Yeah, Tucker, what are your thoughts on um, what does what is love? Not like the old song, you know. <laughs> yeah. Probably too young for you're probably too young for that. But you don't want to sing that? No, not at all. Um, <laughs> I've had a hard enough time about. not trying yeah. to sing it when we're talking about the <laughs> topics. But yeah. so what what uh, what is biblical love yeah. from your perspective? Yeah. So I think one thing for me, um, when you think of love, you think of what Jesus did, and you're like, okay. So you jump to John chapter 14, verses 8 through 9, and that says pretty much that if we've seen Jesus, then we've seen the Father. And so if we know that God is love, then we know that Jesus is also love, Mm -hmm. and that what he's going to do throughout his life is going to show us examples of love, how to love, you know, how to give love. Yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's what I first think of. Yeah. I mean, you're right. You talk about Jesus, an expression of love, you know, and there's a couple different words in Greek for love, those eros, which is one word, which is like erotic, which the New Testament actually never uses. So, you know, sometimes when you look at TV in Hollywood, they show you that love is, you know, the romantic, the passionate, the, well, there's a side of that that's supposed to be in a marriage, but the Bible actually never uses that word for love. Wow. It uses a phileo or a philia. Some people write it and pronounce it different depending on the form of it, which basically brotherly love, yeah. Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Then you have agape love, which is what a lot of people would say the highest form of love. Um, yeah. William Barclay wrote something about it. I'm, I can't remember it perfectly, but he basically said that it's a state of mind. It's, a, it's an action. Agape love is the way you live. You make conscious decisions. You know, So you'd say, my, I love my wife. Well, what does that mean? Agape love means I'm going to do the things that are best for her in the best way that I know how. And so, yeah, yeah Jesus did that for us, obviously coming and going to the cross. Well, I heard a preacher say recently, we were filming him, and at the end of his sermon, he said, and agape. And so I guess he was just saying like, hey, that highest love yeah. I have for you that are watching. Yeah. And, you know, when you talked about Jesus showing that example, I, I immediately think of Romans chapter five, uh, verses, uh, let's start in verse six. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. So he says, a good man, someone maybe die. A righteous man, eh, I don't know so much. It's almost like yeah. people like good people more than righteous people. It's what it sort of seems to get at. In verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So basically God sent his son, the whole the plan, the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth, being Jesus, while we were still sinners. We did nothing. Yeah. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it, really. Um, and so that's really an example of that agape love where Jesus actively, physically went through something that was awful for our betterment. That sounds just like John fifteen thirteen. 13. Um, there's no greater love than this for a man to lay down his life for his friends. Yeah. Like you look at his life. I mean, even in comparison to marriage, we're supposed to, the husband's supposed to be like Jesus to the wife, to the, and she embodies the church in a way. Yeah. But yeah, just like I am supposed to lay down my life for someone that I love. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's technically what Ephesians five talks about. I mean, it says uh, Ephesians five 28 husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. I mean, so you have that idea there. That's how you're supposed to love it. You know, we talked about Jesus basically leaving heaven 
to come and do that and how we're supposed to imitate that. So what is Christian love? We, God loved, we love mm-hmm. because he first loved us, right? I think yeah. you maybe mentioned that. Did you mention that passage? One of you guys mentioned it. Praise God. So when I go to Second uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, Christians. Well, what kind of mind? Look at verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let uh, each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind, that mind about looking out for the best people in other people, that's mm-hmm. that agape type of love. Let this be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. How did Jesus show that? Being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery, some something to be held on to, right? To be equal with God, because he was, John 1, 1. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He had a bodily form of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. So that's that's what Jesus did for us. So it's literally like when you want to do something and show love to somebody else in your life, you know, I heard Rob, uh, was it Rob maybe? Somebody said this once. They Rob said, Whitaker? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. But um, anyway, they said, um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't Rob. It was somebody in one of my counseling classes. Yeah. Said something about, let's say you're having marital problems, right? And you tell the husband, uh, hey, you need to love your wife. And the husband, or let's say the other way around. Let's say the wife is supposed to love the husband. And she says, well, he doesn't deserve my love. The way, And maybe the way he's treating you, he doesn't. Yeah. But can you do it for Jesus? I mean, the fact that Jesus went to the cross for you, can you then say, okay, because he did that for me, I can be obedient to him. And that's really what first Peter three talks about a wife converting her husband, even yeah. if he's not obedient to the word. So uh, Scott, you, you, let's go back to what you mentioned earlier. You mentioned a really key text that I I'd love to go through. Um, if we can, the first Corinthians, 13. Yeah. first Corinthians 13. <clears throat> sure. This is one that, you know, you, you may have heard mostly at a wedding. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's a great passage for that. But yeah. the context of the whole of First Corinthians, obviously, is a letter written to the church in Corinth that you read about in Acts 16, 18, 18, Acts 18, 8, I think. Um, that's where it was established. And so you read about it, and they had a lot of issues. Their issues were they were having a lot of like infighting in the church. And so Paul is writing to them to basically tell them, hey, look, you need to love your brother and that will fix all your unity problems. And so in 1 Corinthians 13, he's going through some of that. Scott, do you want to you go ahead and read, pick up yeah. wherever you want? Yeah, I can do that. Um, okay, so I've got the King James in front of me. It's going to use the word charity instead of love. I think the New King James uses love, maybe the ASV. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. not sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I, just to make it simpler, I'll substitute love. Sure. And Perfect. Whatever. Perfect. So love suffereth long and is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself and is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never fails. Okay. You want to just go through each one of those? Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we, okay. can, we can do that. Yeah. Um, we don't have to spend too much time on each one, but let's just kind of touch on each one. So love suffers long. That means it's patient, right? Love suffers long and is kind. What yeah. what comes to your mind? That's hard. I mean, just dealing with I mean any kind of situation, not even referring to an enemy or something, but yeah. just being patient with people, and then at the same time being kind. I mean, yeah. If you worked in, you know, I grew up working in a grocery store, and it taught me a lot of just you have to just kind of just wait and like be yeah. respectful to people. Yeah, um, and maybe that'll show Jesus to them. But yeah. yeah. Well, here's this is the thing that comes to my mind. I want to think about God's long suffering and patience. We know First Timothy two three and four and Second Peter three nine talk about how God is patient with everyone. He wants all to be saved. Mm-hmm. But I think about the example of Paul. Right? How patient does God have to be to watch the apostle Paul before he became the apostle to hold the coats while they're stoning Stephen, the first Christian martyr? And Paul wrote this in First Timothy verse fourteen: The grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief, right? However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Christ Jesus might show all long suffering, all patience as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for eternal life. So Paul basically says, you want to talk about that patience, that long suffering of God? I'm an example. I mean, how patient does God have to be to sit there and watch his son, Jesus, be arrested wrongly? beaten spat upon when he could have called you know more than 12 legions of angels 
go to the cross and God just sits there and watches it all for what? Because he knew that's what had to be, the price that had to be paid so we could have our sins forgiven. I mean, yep. you talk about patience. I mean, that's patience. God yeah, having God that. God showed patience uh, throughout human history, right? Yeah. Even, even when his patience ran out, so to speak, with Noah. Yeah. He, he waited how many years before he actually initiated the flood? How yeah. many years did uh, the people get a chance to repent? Yeah. Was that what? Approximately 120. 120 said, My spirit will not yeah. strive with man for 120 years. Yeah. 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 So God shows his uh, long suffering with that. He shows his long suffering nature when it came to Israel and uh, Judah and how many times, especially in the book of Judges, oh, man. right? Yeah. They would repent and they go back to doing wrong. They repent and go back to doing wrong yep. over and over and over for hundreds of years. Yeah. And then you finally see David and Solomon and, and Saul, of course, on the scene before yeah. that. And, uh, you know, the nation goes off into exile into Babylon and he brings them back yep. just over and over and over again. And that's just Israel. Just, that's just that little microcosm of, of human history. You're not yeah. even talking about the long suffering shown towards the Gentiles and the rest of the world and, yeah. you know, us. And mm -hmm. uh, even now, we're still living in his long suffering nature at the moment because there are many people who aren't saved. And if he were to decide that uh, now's the day, this is the end. Yeah. You know, that, yeah. that would be it. But right now, there's still hope. There's still that chance of becoming saved, becoming a Christian. So that's an example of long suffering. Yeah. Uh, kindness. You know, that's yeah. another thing in there, right? Um, yeah. What do you think about kindness? Well, I mean, God's kindness is what leads us to repentance. You know, I mean, when you look at all the good things that God does for us, I mean, what, what, what do you have in this life that didn't come from God? Yeah. One, you know? yeah. one, one night I was thinking, like, like you're, you start thinking, when is Jesus going to come back? And like, why is he waiting? Mm -hmm. And all I can, you know, one thought I could be wrong. One thing I thought I was thinking about was just like, God is patient and he wants everybody to be saved. And like, he's literally, I mean, maybe there's someone out on another side of America and he like, he loves that guy just as much, you know, and as me and you know, well, he loves everyone the same. I'm just saying like, sure. he wants that person to be saved just sure. like he wants me to be saved and this other person. And so he's waiting for everyone at least to get the opportunity to hear the gospel. Yeah. He wants everybody to be saved. Yeah. 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 You make yourself useful to others. Yeah. That's doing someone a kindness. Right? That's right. That's right. Service. Love does not envy. What do you think about that one? Mm. I guess like, I mean, I if want you, what you got and I'm yeah. going to just, yeah, you don't see yeah. somebody else doing well and get, mad about it beyond yeah. beyond just jealous or beyond just saying man i wish i could have that or do that too mm -hmm. you you're reaching a point where now you're looking at what they got and you're upset at them for having it and you're yeah. trying to find a way to take it from them yeah right yeah you're trying to gain that thing for yourself yeah uh and that's yeah. ungodly i mean that's un you should you should be happy for the other person yeah. that has that you know yeah. there's nothing wrong with saying like man you know that i'd really like to attain <laughs> that one one day but whenever you yeah. start disliking that person because of that yeah, it's I mean, like, Aaron, I really like that coffee cup, man. I wish I could get one just like it. Just a little bit bigger. <laughs> Let me just knock you over the head and take yours. So we haven't <laughs> talked about this yet. You probably can't tell, but we, Tucker ordered these coffee mugs from an American company. That's right. But they apparently well, started there. Yeah, started there. They outsourced <laughs> it to some company. We won't mention the country. We don't. But anyway, yeah. when the mugs got in, we ordered six of them. And I said, <laughs> Tucker, that's a small box. And he said, yeah. And I said, there's six mugs in there. So we opened it up, and they're like these mini, little mini mugs. So that's probably the appropriate yeah. amount of coffee cup you yeah. should have. Normal mugs, maybe this big. It's yeah, so they're like little espresso <laughs> mugs. Anyway, okay. Yeah. Moving on. All right. Love does not parade itself is what the New King James says. What do you, what is that? What do you think that means? Well, I mean, you don't see Jesus running around being like, look how great I am. No. You know, you no. see him being meek and humble and yep. kind, and, you know, you want to be like that. But you know, I think it would change your way of how you see Jesus if he was like, look how, like, look how awesome I am. Look at the yeah. power I got. You I know? mean, he, he worked miracles half the time and he says, hey, you know, yeah. don't tell anybody. The not, a self, yeah. not a self-promoter. No, because he's humble. He, yeah, because his whole purpose was to come and die on the cross. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you look at, I mean, just think about that. The creator of the universe speaks the whole universe into existence and he comes to earth in a poor family in a small village how would you expect him to come? You'd probably expect him yeah. to come in chariots of fire. Isn't that know? how they thought he was going to come? He was going to be well, this earthly king? Yeah. Some people thought they yeah. were. That's what their idea of the Messiah was. They thought the Messiah was going to bring back the glory days of David and Solomon. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like whenever you look in Mark chapter 8, after he basically gets them to confess that he's Messiah, and he starts telling them, Mark 8, 31, 9, 31, 10, 34, and 35, about how he's going to suffer and die. And they're like, wait, what? You're the Messiah. You know, you can't, you, the Messiah can't die. 
they had this idea. In John chapter 6, he does a miracle, and they took him, and they wanted to make him a king. And he's like, no, no thanks. My kingdom is yeah. not of this world, John eighteen thirty six. Yeah. I mean, that's not what his mission was. His mission was to seek and save the lost and mm-hmm. to die as a ransom for many. So, that's, that's very similar to the next one, not puffed up, right? Yeah. Not yeah. being full of that arrogance. Yeah, that. Mm-hmm. yeah, not puffed up, not prideful. Um, does not behave rudely. And that's kind of self-explanatory. Yeah, yeah unseemly yeah. In, a, in a way that's not befitting. And, and if you want a, some insight into what that really means contextually, read chapters 1 through 12. Yeah. I mean, yeah. go look at what the Corinthians are doing, and you'll understand why he used these words. Yeah. You'll know what that unseemliness he's talking about there is. Yeah. Right. And in chapters 12 through 14, too, he's talking about in the first century, they had spiritual gifts because they didn't have the Bible yet, right? Right. So how are you going to learn about the New Testament covenant? You don't have a New Testament, okay? They had miraculous gifts. And you had these people that spoke in tongues, and they thought they were better than everybody else. And you've got Paul basically saying, nope, you need to desire you need to desire to prophesy, teach. That's more important. So you had these people that thought they're better than other people mm-hmm. based off certain things. And so yeah. the current, the church in Corinth had a lot of issues. Yeah. I mean, they argued over <laughs> preachers, so to speak. Everything. Right? I am of who? Paul. 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 I'm of Cephas. Cephas. I am of, et cetera. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, just down the line, they would divide over everything. Yeah. They thought one group was better than another. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. you're right. Yeah. All right. Uh, love does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil. I guess the first thing that comes to mind is when Jesus says, like, he's here for the Father, not to carry out the Father's will. Yeah. It's humble. I mean, you got Jesus basically saying, John 16, 12 through 15, I think it's John 12, too, where he says the Father basically gave him his message. Mm-hmm. Jesus is going to give it to the Holy Spirit. He's going to inspire the apostles. Like, it's this basically process that they have humbling themselves yeah. to fulfill the mission. I mean, it really just shows you as a, a humble, uh, humble attitudes. Yeah, um, not, not easily angered, right? That yeah. not provoked. You're not, yeah. you're not quick to, to jump down somebody's throat, yeah. so to speak. To yeah. so use a, a expression or idiom yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've I've seen people like. Don't get me wrong. There's times when somebody says something that's wrong, and you need to bring it to their attention. But I've seen people mm-hmm. who literally just wait for somebody to mess up so they can just jump all over them. And it's like, man, they quickly fly into a rage oh, they, at and the they, smallest thing. And they look, they look for it. You know, mm-hmm. I, I get exposing error, right? If something's wrong, you should expose it. Yeah. But when you just wait for somebody to make one mistake so you can jump on it and look like, you know, I'm yeah. the beacon of truth. It's like, you know, be, you gotta be patient with people too. I'm grateful know? that God's not that way. Just not waiting to like strike lightning down when I mess up. Like, That's he's right. Patient with me. That's right. He's yeah. a loving father. You're not kidding about that. Yeah, right? exactly right. All right. Um, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Man, first thing I think of is first John. I mean, it's like Jesus knows we're going to sin, but yeah. you know, we keep walking in the light, like we're going to mess up, but just, yeah. So, like, if I mess up, like, Scott's not going to make fun of me. He's going to pick me up, and we're going to keep walking together as brothers. Yeah, bear one of those be burdens. Happy every time you fail. Man. Yeah. No, you shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, if there's somebody that I'm watching who's a Christian, and they stumble and fall, I don't rejoice over that. I mean, the Bible even says God doesn't rejoice in the death of the wicked. I've even seen when, like, an ungodly person will die, and people rejoice over it. And I'm thinking, man, you're missing Christianity if you're yeah. rejoicing in an evil person because that person's going to go to hell mm-hmm. if they're evil, according That's to the right. New Testament. I don't, I don't want that. I don't want people to go to hell. Yeah. That's right. Have you read what the Bible says about it? Darkness, outer darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth. Sometimes. I want people to to repent and to come to knowledge of of the of the gospel, obey the gospel, and become Christians. Yeah, it's like some sometimes people have their self appointed rivals. Yeah. at the congregation, and yeah. they'll, they'll think that they're in this power struggle, and they'll be so happy mm. when that person messes up. Oh, I finally got the chance to get them out of here. Mm. I can finally make them look like the uh, the idiot I know them for, whatever mm-hmm. the case is, yeah. and put them down. Yeah, that's not that's not what love does. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I remember thinking I was talking with somebody once about basically putting things in perspective and it was like i use the analogy let's say somebody backs into my car at church right right damages my car i see car i see them do it i have two options i could either be furious about that or i could realize if they lie to me about it that's a see the problem about sin is like if i sin against tucker the sin is me against tucker but it's ultimately against god so if i don't repent of that yeah then i mean that sin has not been forgiven yet so i don't want to go to hell so my thing is like matthew 18 your brother sins against you what do you do yeah, you go to your brother. And then if your brother won't hear you, you go with two or three more. Yeah, bring another brother. If, yeah, and then if he won't hear you, you, go to the church. The whole point of that is reconciliation. It's not, hey, let, let's get this process taken care of so we can disfellowship yeah. this person. It's out of love. Yeah, yeah withdraw our fellowship. It's the purpose is, look, now that's that can be an ultimate consequence, and I've yeah. experienced that in my life. But what you have to do is you have to go through that because you're trying to reconcile that. 
Yeah. You're not supposed to count him as an enemy, but you're supposed to regard him as a brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to save him. Yeah. What? Well, let's see. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Yeah. This is kind of all encompassing. Kind of like a benefit <laughs> of the doubt statement, right? Um, you're gonna you're going to be thick skinned and and work with that brother. Yeah. You know, you're not you're not gonna. It's kind of similar to the what we talked about previously in verse five, in, in a sort of sense, not being easily provoked. You're, you're going to be having that long suffering. Yeah, a lot of these have similar qualities. Yeah, that we talked about in verse four. You're going to bear all things, believe all things. You're going to assume that they're going to tell you the truth. You're going to assume the best out of the situation. You're going to hope for the best out of the situation. Mm-hmm. You're not going to. Uh, you're not going to look for fault yeah. unnecessarily. You know, sometimes people do have faults, but you're not out trying to find that nitpick and tear somebody apart. Yeah. You know. And if you look at the importance of all these things, I like to go back to the beginning of chapter 13. I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And he's going to use what's called hyperbole. All right, we've mm-hmm. heard this before. You're not going to drive my truck in a thousand years. I'm not literally saying a thousand years. He's going to use extremes to prove a point, right? Yeah. So he starts out 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, he's using hyperbole, but have not love, I've become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Okay, he's not, you're not literally a clanging cymbal. He's saying, look, if you have beautiful speech, but you don't have love, it's just noise. Yeah. Right? Uh, if I have the gift of prophecy, speaking about teaching in that, in that uh, the, the gift of teaching in the first century, and I understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Okay, does anyone understand all mysteries and all knowledge other than God? No. Yeah, okay. No. So he's saying, if I basically am the smartest person ever, and I have all the faith... I could move mountains, but I don't have love. I'm what? Nothing. Mm -hmm. He's literally saying, look, if you don't have the right motivation, love behind it, it's worthless. Um, Verse three, although I could bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, that sounds like a pretty good life full of good works, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't have love. Profits me what? Everything? No. It says nothing, nothing, right? So the motivation behind being a Christian is, I mean, it is love. We love because he first loved us. And the way you show, if you love somebody, what's, the number one best way you can show them that you love them spiritually. I guess you know, share Jesus yeah, with them. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly right. If yeah. you, ha- if you have somebody that's already a Christian, your goal should be to keep them, as you said, walking in the light because yeah. you want them to go to heaven. I mean, there's a whole nother, we'll have to do a couple episodes about this idea that once you're a Christian, you can never be lost. Although, mm-hmm. I mean, Hebrews 10 talks about you've been sanctified by the blood of Christ and you can fall from that. So, yeah. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to the Authentic Christian Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network, or GBN for short. You can hop on the App Store, search Gospel Broadcasting Network, and you can download the app. And there's this show, many other great shows that you can watch or listen to. Start learning more about the Bible and uh, why we're here, what our purpose is. Thanks for listening. So if you love somebody, let's say you don't, someone's not a Christian. What's the best way you could love them? They're not a Christian. I guess just let them just let them live the rest of their life. Oh and yeah, never share the gospel with definitely them. definitely not share the gospel. Of course, you know, show the love of the gospel. Be patient with them. Be kind with them. Um, build that friendship up to hopefully one day they'll have an open ears to hear it. Well, and sometimes our culture we talked about tolerance. Our culture sometimes today thinks that if you really love somebody, you just tolerate. You can never tell them they're wrong. If we're going to live by what the Bible says, and Jesus is supposed to be our perfect example. Mm-hmm. I'll always go to what he said in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 29, right? Matthew 23, 29, Jesus answered and said to them, you are mistaken. That word's like planaste in Greek. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. But it basically means you err. You're wrong, okay? Wait a minute, Jesus. God is love. Jesus is God. And he tells somebody they're wrong. Why? You are mistaken not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God, right? Jesus told people they were wrong but he did it with the right intent. Yeah. He loved them. He wanted to correct their error so that they could come back into a right relationship with God. So if it's somebody who's not a Christian, we want them to obey the gospel, become Christians so they can go to heaven. And if they are a Christian, then it's loving to try to correct their error to bring them back into a right relationship with God. Man, I think in John 13, I was over here keying it out. Sure. 13, 34, I believe. Um, a new commandment I give to you that you cannot come. So, well, hang on. Whoops. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. But this will know that you are my disciples. They'll know that you're my disciples if you love, if you have love for one another. Yeah. So they're going to know who we are by that. Yeah. Know we're Christians by our love. Yeah. That's a song. I mean, that's, that's true. I mean, sometimes too, I think I talked about, I know I talked about this on another episode, but I'll bring it up again. 
people will say sometimes like they'll hear a lesson from a preacher and they'll say like, oh, well, he stepped on my toes. And it's like, well, do you want to go to heaven? <laughs> I mean, if I'm sitting there and, and Robert or Don or one of the elders teach something or a class or a lesson and it's exposing something I'm doing in my life, now no one else might know it except me. I'm not going to like be angry at them. I'm going to be like, well, yeah, I guess I need to take care of that if I'm going to go to heaven, you know? Yeah. And if you're not reading your New Testament, you need to get on reading it because that's one of the ways you're going to grow as a Christian is you're going to read about what the New Testament says, know that God has love for you, and hopefully that will bring your life into accordance with what the New Testament says. So we got about uh, two minutes. You guys got any concluding thoughts, anything that you've kind of been thinking about through the show? Hmm. Well, uh, I know that um, if you want to know what love is, Considering Christianity, read your Bible. Yeah. Read these passages we talked about, but read through the New Testament. There are many others that deal with love, not just 1 Corinthians 13. Yeah. You'll get a completely different idea and definition of what love is if you watch, if all you do is watch TV. Yeah. All you do is read novels. They love to dramatize it. They love to romanticize it. And they typically emphasize only certain qualities of it, yeah. leave out others. When, when Hollywood does that too, if you watch a movie and you think, oh, this romantic, passionate love, you might have that when you first get married, but let's say that that starts to wear a little bit later, and then you watch a Hollywood movie and you think, "Oh man, is there more to life?" It's like, no, it's a movie. You know, yeah. don't don't be too overly critical of the relationship that you have because the relationship mm -hmm. you have is probably a great relationship. You know, yeah. You got any yeah. thoughts, Tucker? Yeah, if I love somebody and I have the greatest news on earth, yeah, even if it's hard and even if it is some sort of tough love, mm -hmm. like. Why would I not share it? Even yeah. if it turns someone's life upside down. Yeah. Because, you know, I think it's the same for me. If so, if my wife wouldn't have shared the gospel with me, even though it was tough, like I wouldn't be saved. Yeah. And so, yeah. When you look in the book of Acts, what's one of the accusations about Paul and the apostles? These men have everywhere turned the world yeah. upside down. Upside, upside down. down. Yeah. I mean, when they were going preaching, the, you think about to a community, let's say they're, you know, Acts 17, they're going and preaching. You turn from dead idols to the living God, you don't think that's going to turn your life upside down? I mean, you have somebody that's a non-Christian and you teach them the gospel and they have to give up a lot of things in their life that yeah. they may have had no reason to realize were sinful before. You got to turn that life over to God. It's going to turn your life upside down, right? Oh yeah. But whenever you've got this much, you say this is a hundred years and even if it was only, you know, this long to eternity, of course, eternity is going to, if this is a hundred years, Think about going to the moon and back a million times and you still haven't got close to yeah. nowhere near coming any closer to eternity. It's a cool comparison. Yeah, well, thank you. I made <laughs> it up welcome. on the spot. So you would realize that this life is such a short time to determine where you're going to spend eternity. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk uh, talk about in the next episode, I think, how to respond to criticism from others. That's right. So uh, thank you for watching the Authentic Christian Podcast. We appreciate your time and we look forward to discussing another topic next time with you right here on the Authentic Christian Podcast. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the show today. We'd like to mention you can download these episodes. They are sponsored by the Gospel Broadcasting Network. We have an app available. You can check that out and get answers to life's biggest questions.